What else beauty matter? That thought of question I was afraid of. <laughs> That's a big question. most architects don't think that beauty matters and uh, so it's a very complex issue and I just wanted to bring it in. I grew up in Tel Aviv and I grew up in the 50s and 60s as a younger person and uh, Israel was still a very socialist country and the look of things didn't matter. Beauty completely didn't matter, it was part of you know the, the, the culture but still what matters is content not form, not the look of things. There's an expression in Hebrew that says, and it's very common in, in Israel, don't look at the jar, the vase, you know, but at the content. And the content was important. When I grew up, I said, no, I wanted to do architecture because I, I wanted to do things with make the world more beautiful. And then when I started studying architecture, it was completely irrelevant. Um, beauty matters because I think it's quite abstract, quite often, um, which I kind of like. It's really hard to define and it keeps you questioning what it is. I think it's a really big question, but it is something that when you find it, when you discover it, it gives you the greatest feeling that you can imagine. You know? So I think it, it means a lot and that's why so many people are inspired by it. Wow, beauty is important for our life and for our future. Wow, the beauty and the usefulness could be well integrated and I'm always trying to make such a beautiful integration. Well my profession is about beauty so mathematicians know, ask a mathematician why does he do mathematics and he will answer you with 100% certainty because of beauty. I do mathematics because it's beautiful. Beauty matters because beauty is the opposite of what I call the literal. The literal includes any form of knowledge and the only actually two forms of knowledge that exist are either reducing a thing downward to its pieces or upward to its effects. But beauty isn't like that. Beauty has to do with what's intrinsic to a thing, and it's that which is in the thing that is not reducible in either direction. Beauty matters because, um, from a, a neuroaesthetic point of view, because it satisfies the brain. Um, it satisfies in a number of ways. Uh, I mean, of course, it, it does matter, and it's this kind of, as, as the head curator, Yael Reisner says, this kind of un unspoken thing that outside of anyone or any of the creative disciplines, it gets thrown around a lot. Uh, you hear people say that things are beautiful every day, usually, but within the creative field, usually not. Okay. It matters because everyone else who's not creating or who's not designing or creating, whatever it might be, buildings or objects or films, or uh, constantly refer to it as a real value for things in their environment. So obviously it does matter. In that sense, yeah. If you put effort into something, I think inherently there's a reward at the end, um, and within that there's a there's a natural sense of care, and in that care comes you know love, and within love there's some some beauty somehow. Some people say beauty matters now. That's so much heavier subject, but actually it's all it, they're all important, and I think that that good architecture day if it's not I think sustainability without beauty is failing. It's not, you know, and I think everybody knows that because if we tick all the boxes of, you know, uh, building, you know, it's, uh, we tick all the sustainable requirements, if the building is ugly, we're not successful. So people know that. 
But you know, if you look at the awards and competition and juries and judgments, people don't even know how to talk about beauty. So it's not a category. It's a hidden category because we're still not choosing a terrible looking building that tick all the boxes. But it's so undiscussed and became so kind of irrelevant that we have to bring it back to be able to, d t to learn how to talk about it. Opposite of beauty. Wow, that's a challenging question. Opposite to beauty is politics. <laughs> okay, that's really ugly. <laughs> I mean, that's pretending, it's make, uh, making shows, lying. Politics is opposite of beauty. Yeah, because I like to see the world in a positive way. So even if it is not beautiful yet, well, we can make it beautiful. The opposite of beauty is not the ugly, but the literal. The literal is the kind of understanding that thinks a thing is nothing more than the qualities it has. Whereas for me, both the beautiful and the ugly have to do with splitting the easy relationship between an object and its qualities. So they have a kind of tension between them. The opposite of beauty. Uh, well, I'm not sure it has one. Um, the opposite of beauty is certainly not ugliness, even though uh, we, do we do find interesting uh, correlations, but also very interesting differences in terms of, of brain activity during reports of beauty and during reports of ugliness. subject with me for quite a while. There is a troubled relationship between architecture and beauty. So beauty became an empty word. It's sort of bourgeois, not progressive. You know, it has all the bad connotations. And I think it's still there because the cultural bias is so deep. At the end, I think every architect in his heart knows that beauty matters. Architecture is a bit complicated thing. And you have to include lots of people into it. If you're designing a huge building, then there are tens and tens of people who are influencing the process. And uh, if you make a piece of art, then you can do it uh, almost alone. And no one is bothering you. And you make the choices. Mm -hmm. Not the ventilation guy, not the energy calculator, not the construction engineer, not the client. You don't have the client. You are the client. So <laughs> that's why I love I like that uh, personal approach uh, in that matter. Of course, beauty is very important, but beauty is not the only one priority of architecture design. For me, I feel beauty come out through the integration of the whole complexity of the world into one architecture in a very simple ideas, but creating such a diversity. And so I, in the process, I, starting point, I respect the whole complexity of the world, the complexity of the, the project and the situation, and listen to everything, in a sense, and then try to find out how we can, yeah, integrate. Even though the whole situation is very nicely complex and diverse, Finally, we have to make a something, one project. So this is kind of the process of the integration, but not simplifying the situations, like a keeping the richness of the complexity and try to find the amazing viewpoint through which we can, we can see the whole world really harmonized. The use value of a building should be aestheticized. Uh, Immanuel Kant didn't think architecture was a very high form of art because it's contaminated in a certain sense with usefulness. But I think usefulness can also be aestheticized in its own right. Generally, the idea is that artifactual category is dependent upon the biological category. And we might at first want to assign architecture to an artifactual category and keep it there. Um, but if we look at how the brain responds to architecture and the way it responds to biological beauty. There are many more similarities than we might at first expect. 
And so unlike, say, furniture design or um, tool design, architecture fulfills a very interesting middle ground between the extremes of biology and sort of like machinery. It is difficult to speak about um, beauty, uh, to have a conversation about it, because we consider it a very subjective matter. Uh, more and more there is uh, attempts to, to try to find what is it and to try to find a common ground um, from the field of neuroscience or the field of psychology. Um, however, I mean, it, I don't think one needs to, um, to create a universal rule. I'm going to think something quite terrible, but I really think it's true. For people to change their mind, or if we want people to believe in something, we, we feel it's right, and, but it's fresh and new. It takes sometimes a whole generation to die, to have the next generation to take it for granted. And when a cultural bias is very deep, it takes more than a day or two months to change the, the, you know, to change the feeling, the thoughts, the, uh, the responses, the, you know, because people act against the terrible beauty for so long that you don't just say, oh, now it's fashionable to think this way. It's not. It's something much deeper. It's not a style or a trend or, or a trend. Or it's something really deep in the way we think. It's really part of our culture. This is not necessarily something that you search for. You know, you not say, you know, here you go, this is the project that we're you know, presenting and it's beautiful because it seems to be a status quo. Yeah, when I was a student of university, in a summer holiday, I made a the trip, round trip of Europe. And the first place was Paris. I landed in the morning time and then I took a train to come into the center of Paris, come out from the, the, the enter of the, the subway onto the street. And then I was, I was really impressed by the beauty of the city of Paris in the morning sun. That was the moment I still really remember as a, as a really strong reality. Yeah, life and the city itself and the weather, light, and yeah, the combination of the everything created such a amazing beauty. And I take at least one month every year completely off from the architecture and go to my favorite place, uh, Tokyo, and stay there for one month and walk like 30 kilometers in a day with my camera around the huge chunk of city, the world's largest urban sprawler almost. And that's my vacation and that's my method to find new things and new beauties. What I was trying to, to achieve in terms of the exhibition is to, you know, there was a task for the different exhibitors. So I selected the architects and, and there was a, they got a task, right, which was uh, uh, to come up with the habitation projects, right, because we are, the plan was to look at beauty through the lens of habitation. Uh, I was very keen to wrap it all up with a certain atmosphere that enhanced the the expression of aesthetics. The vision for habitation today or tomorrow uh, is not anymore the image of metropolis, the 1930s, you know, the kind of Alon New York with the airplanes and all the different uh, transportations and all very mechanical and all of that, the new technologies of the past, but actually a lot more nature. Uh, the intention was to, to enhance a certain atmosphere which was very important for me. And then we got another thing, which were, we were lucky to apply for a grant to have the VR experience, which is for a lot of us quite interesting. But it's not just the notion, oh, I see a headset, I'm happy to go into the 3D situation. Uh, it was really about understanding the 
the projects better. So actually what you experience is to get into the project in a different way, in way than just section plans, renders, 3D on the screen in the upper floor. In fact, by definition, uh, something being virtual means that um, it shares the attributes of something without being completely that other thing. Right? By definition, it's referencing something else. So if you have not experienced that something else, you're not fully understanding the virtual experience that you're having. Yeah, so the, the project is called The Van Room and it speculates on what our domestic lives and our homes will turn into when um, AR, augmented reality, becomes something that normal people use every single day. We speculate on that uh, the computer monitor and the smartphone will disappear in common use in the next 15 to 20 years and will be replaced by spatial computing, basically that all the the computation platforms that we use from social media to productive software, whatever, will be spatial and therefore also all of our social activities that are digital. Well, augmented reality was particularly appealing because uh, it had a significantly lower barrier to entry or w we worked to create a lower barrier to entry than typically you have with robotics or machine learning which have a very high technical overhead and it's very difficult to both teach design and to teach the kind of fundamental knowledge that's required to pursue those topics. Uh, whereas we find that uh, with augmented reality, it's really engaging for people to work with their hands uh, and to be crafting things in a slightly more traditional way while also engaging with the technology behind it. The pavilion is produced by steam bending timber and it's a little bit punk in its attitudes towards, say, detailing, which is just not at all important in that, that project. It's, it's rough and raw. Um, and it's, it's super steampunk in its relationship to technology. You know, we're doing things by hand with old analog tools, um, but we're using this, like, let's call it like a magical headset, which shows you all of the information that you need to construct something wildly complex. I guess we are trying to offer a vision for an alternative way to think about designing and making though, which is um, much more democratic. So it opens up the accessibility of digital models to people who maybe aren't digitally literate. And that is a real, I think that's a really important vision because we're at risk of losing a whole lot of um, material expertise and knowledge and skills by automating everything or by doing everything through digital modeling. And it's also very important to keep in mind that what we today call VR or AR is not a technology that came out of nothing. It is a natural progression of virtual media that has been developing since the very first ones. You could even include the non-digital or non-electric ones, such as sculpture and painting. But if we do include the early analog ones such as photography and then leading up to the motion picture, the television and then the computer monitor, they're all the same project. And AR and VR is just the next um, step. I guess we don't intentionally try to create uh, work that we don't like. I mean, we like what we do, that's why we do it. Yeah, I think functionality in itself is something that we probably focus on at an early start, it's like how, how everything is going to work. And then through the explorations of the meaning and virtually everything that's going to be used for, the beauty somehow emerged. Our work really looks at simplifying um, methods and taking craft, um, but using kind of digital models to, to find ways in which we can use repetition and use um, certain kind of um, technologies to encourage those crafts to make something um, totally new and unique. And I think VR and um, updated technologies such as that may help concretize, help us make more sense of some of these more abstract thought experiments that maybe haven't had that much tooth um, 
in other disciplines outside of philosophy. It may help with discourse across disciplines, um, just to help make sense of, of those more abstract ways of thinking. It's a personal project for me. So far, it's probably the most personal thing I have ever done in an art form, because uh, it describes uh, the environment which I was uh, growing up like in more than 10 years. I spent my childhood in a huge housing block of uh, Lasname, which is part of Stalin. And uh, for some reason, it, uh, it matters to me still. So I'm here in Tallinn as part of the Tallinn Architecture Biennale to um, bring a project called Musicity, which is a project I've been developing for the past eight years. And the idea is that we work with local musicians from Tallinn to each create a piece of music inspired by a different location and a different building. For a long time I was kind of curious about the idea of commissioning music based on architecture, so the idea that you could have um, a soundtrack to a building. But the secret is, you know, you need a smartphone with our app and you go to the location and then you can stream the music. So it basically gives you a sense of the building and the musical response to it. One of the words that we love is ambiguity. And, um, you know, so virtually, like, our work sometimes been described as ugly. And <laughs> it seems to be surprising for us because, obviously, we don't really perceive it this way. But, with, you know, with time, we actually took it as a compliment. Who said our work was ugly? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Okay. Just get that one. I got further confidence to go about it uh, through finding scenario science and talking to mathematicians and other disciplines that actually uh, beauty matters to them, they never stop believing in beauty. You know, the part of the idea of the symposium was uh, one of the ideas there was to bring the neuroscientist, the philosopher, the mathematician and the poetess to uh, uh, argue and discuss the, the subject because they, all, all of them, who came in uh, believe in the return of beauty or in the beauty that never disappeared or in the, uh, the importance of it. I was invited here because I believe strongly that beauty should be at the center of philosophy and that goes very well with what Yale wanted the conference to be about. Um, and I am here representing Semir Zeki and the neuroaesthetic point of view and some findings from the um, UCL Laboratory of Neurobiology. Mathematics is not a science, it's art. Uh, why is that? Because when things fall into place, that's what happens in mathematics, you f you're trying to find some order. And when things fall into place, that's beautiful. That's when something just right fits right uh, the, into the... Mm, like a puzzle. That's, you find a piece of puzzle that fits just right, you feel it's beautiful. And that's what happens in my profession. So, uh, and I brought them to make the architects who are not confident about the subject, who are still have much deeper cultural bias against it. I hope that these scholars will make them more confident. I will just make them think about it. Ah, beauty is a silly thing, it's a you know, nice detail. Or That's not beauty. Beauty is, and what we heard in the symposium by different people and different disciplines, beauty is much more profound and beauty is, 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 is much harder to get, to achieve, I mean. And, and so, uh, and you know, say people refer, but they hear beauty because it's so undiscussed and uh, they think of Renaissance, because Renaissance was talking about beauty, perfection and ideal beauty and all that. It's not the beauty today. So, as I keep saying, beauty is not a singular idea. Beauty could be many different things. Not things, but different aesthetics. We all know that. We are aware of it. Aesthetics are changing, but we know very well when something is beautiful, when something is not beautiful. Beauty is about truth, about fitting into the world. Beauty is about hidden order. There is some hidden order that you find. And this order is something that fits into the picture. In this case, in this sense, it is true. It's truth, about truth. I think we shouldn't say we have like a one beauty 
and everybody should go for that. This is not. This is kind of the misunderstanding. I think we we can find a lot of different beauty, and all of them has kind of a amazing values on it. Um, in the natural world and in the diversity that keeps the natural world coexisting, um, it's the differences that create those, those moments of beauty. Um, it is very much a subjective word, which is why I think it's been such an interesting conference, is everyone's got a very different opinion to what beauty might, might mean. I think beauty is uh, one aspect of aesthetics. So aesthetics is a larger philosophical discipline that interfaces with other disciplines such as neurobiology. It signifies uh, the stabilization of perception in an otherwise unstable world. It's a collision of different ideas and to me the best or the most impressive beauty is when you get disparate things clashing. So a mixing of different ideas and cultures and that to me is creating the best beauties. No one can define beauty, but we can categorize. We, can, we have a lot of characteristics. So as I keep saying, it's just like love. People understand that we cannot define love in five words, but there are lots of characteristics. So I think it's a big subject to come back to.